Hello, and welcome to Research Software Hour. What number are we on? Number six? This is number six. Hmm. Yeah, it's starting to feel a bit routine. So, <laughs> let's see, what's the usual stuff? Um, this will be recorded, it will be on YouTube later. If you look below, you see a link to a HackMD pad, which everyone can edit. You can write there or the Twitch chat and immediately talk to us and we will see it and answer your questions. Please give us ideas for stuff to talk about this week and next week. In fact, this week was basically all inspired by some questions that people had, which we mm -hmm. just built the program around. So. Let us know your problems and we will solve them, or at least discuss. Any other basic should intro stuff? Oh yeah, the other basic intro is that, I don't know, should we say who we are or is it already everybody familiar? So we are uh, yeah. Adwan Bast from Norway mm -hmm. and Richard from Helsinki. Mm -hmm. Also, we, we will talk about resource software development tools, Linux, uh, also, high performance computing. We haven't done much high performance computing until now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anyone have a code you would like to get us to run on a cluster? If you have something with not too large input data, then you can take it and we can basically, well, do the porting and explain what we think about it. Okay. Yes. Also, uh, connecting to last week, uh, we talked about Binder. It would be really nice in, I don't know, next session, some other session to talk about Binder, Binderizing. And it would be really fun to take a real project of somebody and we would we would Binderize it together. And it's mm -hmm. it's really not much work and it's really super useful. So we appreciate contributions. Yeah. And today will okay. be really about testing. So we will talk about how to approach testing, how to uh, like test design, test uh, the tools, test automation. Um, mm -hmm. We will look at GitHub Actions. And later we'll also discuss a bit uh, how to how to clean up Git history, how we do mm -hmm. it. And there is something new I learned. And I also learned that Richard already knew that. But we will we will see how, how we can use this. Yeah. OK. So testing for science. So I guess we're here to talk, like we're gonna talk about something that's very practical and less pure. At least that's how I approach testing for science. So mm -hmm. mm, I guess we accept that if you're a scientist, then you'll probably have some projects which you'll test really well, but a lot of projects you sort of just get it out of the way with and make it good enough. So what is that good enough? Um, exactly. And I think we should not really try to test everything and every single function. And I mean, we will talk about that. I don't know whether mm -hmm. we should, maybe this this contribution, the issue that we got is like a starting point Yeah. for the discussion. Let's take a look at it. Should I screen share? We, will you uh, have it open here? If you have it open, I'll share you. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please do. There you are. And... So here we are collecting these like, issues, suggestions. We collect our ideas, but we also really appreciate when we get when we get a nice suggestion. Mm -hmm. And today's lesson is really inspired by by this suggestion here, section on unit testing. And here there are really good questions um, that we will that we can discuss. So what what makes a unit test a good test? Yeah. And also, is this presupposing that it's a unit test, or do we consider other kinds of useful tests? So for my work, I'll usually have some unit tests, which are basically testing one particular function, which usually is somehow already easy to test. But then also I'll have a few tests which test the whole pipeline, so running it on some standard inputs and, well, it might be as simple as just making sure the program completes and writes an output, or it might start to verify what kind of output it actually makes. So, yeah, what do you usually do? 
Yeah, the unit can be it can be a function, it can be a module, it can be the whole library. So I think when I like these days, it took me a while until I learned to appreciate testing. But these days, when I start with a new project, I start with unit testing early, and then I mm -hmm. test functions. But I don't test all the functions. I test I test those like the non-trivial ones, mm -hmm. those where I'm not really sure that I will not break them or uh, or those functions which i broke recently mm -hmm. um, then if i'm yeah. if i'm in an existing project i often start from the other side so i start from the i test the whole thing and i do that typically when i'm about to rewrite it so before i change i start mm -hmm. changing the project mm -hmm. I, I add an overall test so that i have something to hold on to while refactoring uh, yeah. the code how do you how do you approach it yeah, I mean, I guess like many people or possibly many people, I test what's recently been broken because, well, mm -hmm. in fact, that's a really easy way to make some new tests. When something gets broken, then you take it and, well, you have to run it several times to see if your fix actually works. So if I'm going to run it several times, I may as well put it in a test and then run that test over and over again. Yeah. and then go from there. Sometimes these days I would even design my project so that it has, um, how would you say, like the core, like the actual difficult scientific logic gets put into mm -hmm. a few functions which are deep on the inside. And then I make sure mm -hmm. these are pure functions and relatively easy to test and then write the test there. And then everything else comes when I see it as important. Yeah, really great point. I like, um, and this is also why I learned to appreciate testing is that um, it's it's relatively easy to test a function that is pure, which mm -hmm. doesn't have side effects. Uh, and when I introduce testing early into my code coding, the code will it it won't, won't let me. Uh, create right code which has a lot of side effects and statefulness. Mm -hmm. So I like to introduce it also into the core functions. And maybe connecting also to the question here, so uh, writing unit tests for older code. And this is often a situation where we are in. So we we enter a project, there is already mm -hmm. code, mm -hmm. and it's already there since 20 years, many people. And of course now we cannot go in. And I think it wouldn't make really sense to go in and write unit tests for every single function for half a million lines of code. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think there, I I often really, the, the only thing I do is for a couple of representative uh, inputs, I run the whole code through it, and and then I save the whatever it produces. And I verify when, that when I run it again, I get the same result. And what I then do is that I do that for a few examples, and then I measure uh, code coverage. So I have a look at which part of the code is traversed when I run the test set, which part is not. Mm. Then I can decide, do I add more or not? So I get a bit of mm. a feel of what mm. part of the code is tested, what part of the code is untested. And I, I want to make sure that the part that I'm about to rewrite, that is tested. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah. And well, then what about, well... Mm. Yeah, the next question is, what about more complicated functions, like random functions? Has this come up often in your work? Mm. Yes, yes, it does. Uh, because I often, no, well, sometimes I use random numbers to generate like a starting distribution of, I don't know, points. And then I, mm -hmm. so what's important then is that I use, um, uh, I set the random seed to a specific value. Mm -hmm. So that so that every time I run these tests, I actually get the same result. So it's not, it's reproducible. It's random, but reproducibly mm -hmm. random. So that's a, uh, what, what I haven't done in my work much is to, and I think we should talk about it too, is how, how you can test if your results have a certain distribution and you want to make sure that whether this is reasonable or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
One of the tests I was most proud of is when I was implementing someone's network generation model. So basically I'd give it say a hundred nodes and some parameters for generating the model. And I wanted to know, is my code minimally correct here? Mm -hmm. So like, is it even generating something reasonable? So mm -hmm. not even knowing what kind of, like fully understanding what would come out of the model, but there were some things that I could write down, like just know by looking at the science behind it. I knew if one parameter went to one, then the graph should be complete. So basically every link should exist in there. So I tested mm -hmm. taking that parameter to one and then running it and making sure that it was a complete graph. And then I went the other way and made the parameter zero and made sure it was a incomplete graph. And then something in the middle and it was something in the middle. And there were several of these different parameters I could take that would force it one direction or another direction. And well, this didn't That's actually right. make sure that the model, like the code was actually correct, but it actually mm -hmm. did find some pretty easy bugs to get rid of. And now that I think about it, maybe I found some bugs in the original code also because I was mm -hmm. re-implementing it or something like that. One thing I also like to do for more complicated code, which is maybe, okay, so sometimes I start out with by writing a very simple code, which is slow, but it's it's kind of, it's so simple that it's mm. almost obviously correct. Mm -hmm. But but it's, I don't know, quadratically scaling or cubically scaling. It's, right. it's terribly slow. Mm -hmm. But then, so I, I, I write that first. Then I know I have something to refer to, and then I write mm -hmm. the the better implementation, which is I don't know faster or better memory footprint, but mm -hmm. it's more complicated. And then I yeah then I can verify the the fast function compared to the obviously correct slow function. Mm -hmm. then, then I do it for I don't know for many many different input files, and then mm -hmm. then I can be reasonably confident that this is, this is working. So I, I've done that a couple of times. Yeah. And I guess that only works in the simple way if both, if it's deterministic what the output will be. Yes. yes. Um, yes. Or at right. least within yes. numerical accuracy. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I like to uh, kind of an advice, or because it's a really good question, like how do you test something that is more complicated? Because often we show these really simple examples. Mm -hmm. But something I like to say is that so if you look at if you look at the result as a human, what are you looking at if you want to verify whether this is reasonable or not reasonable? So what are the things that you are looking at? Yeah. So I look at this and I look at that, then I got I make sure that this and that. And then now try to explain me that over the telephone. Like what are the steps that you do? And try to verbalize mm -hmm. it. And then you actually have a test. Yeah. So that you know, can be another approach. That's actually a good point. After you write some code, how do you even convince yourself that it's correct if it's a random output? Like, how many, I wonder how many people just write something and then make a paper based off of it, and then, yeah. um, <laughs> like, yeah, because you have to you know, check the limits. So like, how does it how they, does it behave when you increase this and decrease yeah. that? Yeah. And is that even like when I increase the number, does it do I get the distribution that I expect? Mm -hmm. It's not it's not trivial. No. Yeah. Yeah. One I thing know. that I forgot to say when we talked about um like the first question, which was um which was like what makes a good unit test. Um so somebody told me that I shouldn't put multiple asserts into the same test. Mm -hmm. So in one unit test, I should not test multiple things i sometimes do that because i'm some like yeah. lazy and i put several things into the same test mm -hmm. uh, because i don't want to repeat code but there is yeah. a way around it because we can use text test fixtures mm. to, uh, to not repeat code but the motivation yeah. was that um well like if you have, if you have several asserts in one test mm -hmm. if the first fails you never see the other ones whether they work or, or not yeah. work and you may need to like you need to go in and comment it out and rerun the whole thing to find out whether the other thing is also broken. So it can help mm -hmm. you. It can help you to get a more narrow answer. Yeah. 
purpose what's really working and what's not working yeah on the quite practical purpose oftentimes i do have multiple asserts in there but yeah. then i accept that if the first one's failing i'm not going to see the last ones and it's a bit more work debugging for me actually i've yeah. heard a similar thing about writing number of tests let's see what was it there was some quote something like never go to c with two chronometers so the idea is back in the old days of sale you have a watt or a clock and that's used to tell what your um let's see latitude is no mm -hmm. what your longitude is but if yeah. you have two clocks and then they don't agree then you don't know where you are at sea so the idea that this is is that if you have one test you don't know if your test is failing or if your actual code is failing but to me that's sort of a bit too mm -hmm. pure for my tastes so it's true that once you have a test failing it could be the test itself is wrong but once something goes wrong, I know I have to look at both the test and the code and figure out what it is. So mm -hmm. if I was at C with two clocks, well, I'll know there's two possible positions that I could be in. And yeah. in that case, I just assume I don't know anything and then go on. So. And related you know. to that, what I now always do is when I add a new test, I, I actually also verify the test. Mm -hmm. So I add the test and then I I go into the code and I break it. Mm -hmm. I verify mm -hmm. whether the test captures it because it has it has really it has bitten me. Yeah. I, I, I have had a test and I was really proud of myself and and the testing was green and mm -hmm. everything was working. And then a weeks later I realized that the test would always <laughs> be happy. Yeah. Uh, and so now I also verify whether this thing captures anything. Yeah. Once there was some code that had a test for something, but they had modified either the code or test and it wasn't working anymore. But, um, let's see, it wasn't working anymore, but the test didn't report the error anymore. I was like, oh, I spent so long debugging this and the test was wrong. <sighs> but, <laughs> but yeah, like this idea of just like going in and editing the code itself and breaking it to make sure the test actually fails is a great idea. But yep. I never go f so far that I um, make a test that breaks the code and verifies that the first test runs. Oh, no, no, <laughs> no. I'm, I'm very pragmatic. I do, it's, it's a three minute thing to go in and change something, change one number and see whether this is capturing anything. I'm not, I'm not very systematic about it. Yeah. To have a, Bit of a safety net. Yeah. And about this <clears throat> testing more complicated functions, we will come back to that. So later we will mm -hmm. we will show PyTest as an example yeah. too. But then we will we will try to test a function which is not completely trivial. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a comment in the Twitch chat. What about multiple expects except for asserts? Thinking about Google Test. So the way I interpret this is that you expect there to be a certain number of instead, not expect, accepts. Mm -hmm. What about multiple accepts instead for asserts? <laughs> hmm. do, you under, do you understand this uh, comment? So it's, it's, uh, it's like accept the opposite of assert or? Is it like make sure that something is not, or maybe I think it's exam. Uh, ah, okay, mm. it doesn't stop. That. Mm. Okay. No, that would be the yeah, good that's... way to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, and in fact, the way PyTest is written, which we'll demonstrate, it just sort of well, it uses assert because it's already there, but making something nicer that wouldn't stop the execution when it failed would make much better reporting and i'm sure that um, i guess there there is a way also to to apply this to continue well no actually mm -hmm. if it's a, if it's a simple assert it will fail yeah no i take that back yeah 
So the next question from the issue, how to test functions that only print out some summary on the terminal. I've had, I've had this issue several times. And for that, I basically take the code and make sure the printing is separate from the calculation. So I test the calculation and then there's the main script wrapper, which prints to the terminal. Of course, you can do things like capturing what the standard out should be. And in fact, PyTest and probably most other test functions have some way to automatically capture the standard output and verify that it does what you need. But in practice, well, yeah. I'm happier to separate the calculation from the printing and then if there's any test of the printing, do something really simple and make sure the calculation tests are as simple as possible. Yeah, and again, that's all. By, do, by doing that, you make a function which is pure, mm -hmm. because then by separating out the printing, the printing input output is inherently mm -hmm. stateful. So by that you separate it out, you can test it, and the like the printing you can then. The printing part you can test, I don't know, visually. You can also, in the mm -hmm. Python case, you can maybe use the logging logging module, and then you can capture things mm -hmm. in a more fine-grained way. I have even seen that even in Python, some like if you get a module from somebody else, and it's full of print statements that just go into the standard output, and you, you, mm -hmm. you cannot go into the code and modify all that, but you can still capture it. So there is a way to capture all that and, and verify mm -hmm. it. Yeah. But I think I agree with the approach. I would also try to separate as much as, much as possible. Yeah. And really, once you start doing testing, then your mind switches to this more modular thought so that you um, write code that's easier to test, which also makes it more modular and just better quality overall, even, mm -hmm. even without the tests. Yeah. And the last one, how to test failure of functions error message, all that. Well, almost every framework will have some way to do that. So you can run a function and you assert that the function raises some particular exception. Um, yes, and this is one way to, so some the function module raises an exception and you, you catch it and you make sure that you caught the exception that you expected, mm -hmm. that's one way. The other way, and that is more, in, in the strongly typed languages that you can express your function to maybe like return a result and uh, mm. and whether it's like success or failure mm -hmm. in your return type. There are languages where you can return uh, an option mm -hmm. and the option can be either none or the result. And then you can, mm -hmm. you can check for these. So that's a different approach. Yeah. One can, of course, one can use that approach also in I don't know Python and, and C++. So that, yeah. that would be a different approach. Mm. Yeah, we missed the question: How do we test private class member functions? And there's some suggestions there on the HackMD. Um, I guess it depends on what language and test framework you have, but. Mm -hmm. Since I've mostly done Python, that hasn't really been an issue. But I know for any language, there must be options that do it because yes. a language without a testing framework doesn't really count as a language, at least to some people, yes. if you know what I mean. Yes, so difficulty with these, so what, what is a bit more difficult about these private methods? Well, it depends whether they are again whether they are pure or they are often not pure. they are often because often the object has a state mm -hmm. so then you maybe you need to build up like you need to mm. initialize it and you but but there are frameworks that can do that i mean that they can initialize the object and run test the, the methods and then drop it i mean destroy it or deallocate it yeah So time's running late. Maybe we should go on and I can do a really quick demonstration of PyTest. So yep. an Sweet. actual testing framework for Python. So I'll switch to my screen here. And there it is. So um, here I have in the 
RSH demos repository. I added two files, to test.py and test to test.py. Maybe I should have had a slightly better name, but well, that's what we've got. Let me exit stuff. Uh, so in to test, there's several functions. The first is taken from code refinery, converting Fahrenheit to Celsius and Celsius to Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. um, so how would I test these? What's your first thoughts? So my first thought is, I don't know, besides this formula, all I really know is that, well, first off, I think this formula is right, but I know it's some linear relationship. So I know two things, the boiling point of water and the melting point of ice. So mm -hmm. in the test file, test to test.py, we see this. So I did test Fahrenheit to Celsius. So I run the function and I uh, run it um, Fahrenheit to Celsius. 32 Fahrenheit should be zero Celsius and 212 Fahrenheit should be 100 Celsius and mm -hmm. vice versa. So here you see I have two asserts in the same function because really at this point, if it breaks, like I just want to know that something's broken and then I can split the test into two later if I want or whatever. I mean, it'd be really cool to parameterize it to be able to pass a list of po all possible inputs and a list of outputs and then to verify them with each other. But I didn't go that far. Um, so let's... I think this is also what... Oh, sorry. This is also what I would have done. I think I would maybe have even stopped here. I, would, I mean, one could go on and one could yeah. test what if happens if I send in a negative Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Like, should, could it go do something or not? Yeah. One could test what if I send in a, instead of a number, mm. if I send in something completely different, but often I'm, I'm a bit even too lazy to go that far. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, here I think that this about matches the difficulty of the problem, especially since I sort of, I basically trust my code. I just want to make sure that I got the nine over five or five over nine or whatever, right? So now I run PyTest. So I can use PyTest on just the directory and actually, if you run PyTest without anything, it runs it on everything in the directory. So it finds every file that begins with some prefix, prefix test underscore anything. So here we're using the convention, the module name with test underscore prefix to it. Hmm. Of course, this is configurable what it looks for. And it says that five tests passed. Five because there's a few more tests at the bottom, which you don't see yet. So how do I make sure the test actually works? Well, we do the thing which we did here and I will try to break it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let, let's add some plus, plus 1.5 or um, yeah. Sure. Um, and what do you know? There's an error. And one of the nice things, so you may think, okay, if I write it in PyTest, now I can't really debug it so, so well. With PyTest, there's a PDB option, which will start the Python debugger right here. And then I can start running things myself. Hmm, this is weird. I, I did not know that. Uh, let's do 40. So I get the idea that it's off by what might be a constant for everything. Of course, I can do continue and set breakpoints and whatever else. Mm -hmm. I will exit and then come back and fix it. Let's make a different kind of bug. Let's make this um, a float division into an integer division. Hmm, what do you know? It still passes. So the test actually doesn't test everything it should. But, well, I'll let you think about how to solve that yourself. So here's another function. This is zero. Actually, it's not really well named because it's not really is it zero, but it's a random variable 
It's the sum of n random variables that are either 0 or 1 divided by n. So basically, it's a uh, normal distribution around um, 0 with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of, let's see. Actually, I'm not sure I did this right. I think it's about 1 divided by the square root of n. Actually, I think that is it. But anyway, someone who has done statistics later and isn't, wasn't worried about setting up can check this. So it, this just uses a Python function. And uh, which I actually didn't know, Python now has a random dot choices that lets you give the weights to it. I remember implementing my own weighted random choice at some time and add options. So it returns the sum of these minus ones or one divided by n with probabilities of one minus p and p for minus one and one respectively. So let's go back to the test here. So first are the two simple options. So if I made this function, what would be the first thing I did if I was running it myself? I would just run it in the terminal a few times and make sure it's 0 or 1 there always. So here I run the function 100 times, and then I make sure it's between minus 1 and 1. And I run it with well, only 1 here, but I guess actually I could do it like this here. Make sure that after running it many times, it's always between minus 1 and 1. So it's really primitive, but the kind of thing I might tell someone to do themselves. And then I test the boundaries here. So I make sure that when I set p to 0 or p to 1, then it goes all the way to the boundary cases. And finally, here we do something more even more advanced. So I'm testing this with statistics. So I know, take what n is, and I know what the mean is, and I know what the standard deviation is. And then I do what's basically a statistical test here, that the result should be between three standard deviations of the mean. But there's a problem here, isn't there? The problem is that this will only be right a certain fraction of the time. So I'll never know if my tests are breaking because of probability or because it's actually broken. So to do that, I set a random seed using PyTest here. So the seed random, and if I continue looking down, we see this is a PyTest picture. So the exact syntax here doesn't really matter. But the basic idea is PyTest does some magic. It sees this argument and takes this from the namespace. And then it will get the current random state. It will set some random seed. And then yield, which means it runs this function. So it will always run with the same seed. And then it retort returns the state after it's done. Oh, actually, this is wrong because I changed it. So, but the problem is if this was sufficiently complex, it's possible that even with the different seed, it would fail after some modification and then always fail. So in that case, if it happened, I would just change what the seed was a few times and make sure it still works and then call it good enough because I care more about practicality than purity. So, oh, yeah. And, and here we use the fixture mm -hmm. for the random seed. It can be also used if we have, if you see you have lots of tests and they, they share, there is a lot of code repetition. Then these fixtures can be used to yeah. abstract out the common thing that is common to a number of tests. And I can mm -hmm. use this yeah. to build something up, tear it down after the test. Yeah. So, 
Um, well, that's basically what I had for here. Um, the basic idea here is yeah, but... PyTest is actually really, really simple to use. You don't even have to know any special syntax. I mean, this is basically as simple as it gets. And since it integrates with the debugger and all that, when you're writing something new, you may as well write it as a test instead of testing it in the terminal where you do it only once. Um, in the future, yes, got... sorry, yeah. Go ahead. In the future, we'll set this up to run automatically using GitHub Actions or Travis CI or something, where it'll run this basically all the time automatically. And by future, you mean today or? Because, um, uh... Oh, yeah, actually, you're right. It is today, which is basically yeah. right now. Um, yeah. Uh, so you're supposed to deploy this demo to GitHub Actions. Yes. So mm -hmm. let's do it. I will. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just also wanted to say thanks for a uh, nice hints here on the HackMD. So we got, we got an uh, example for how to capture print in Python, and also there is a way to capture output in PyTest. Mm -hmm. And now uh, what Richard will do, you will yes. commit it and push it to some place, yeah. and then I will um, I will try to add uh, automated testing to it so that we so that we can test we can run this test automatically every time anytime we push to the repository anytime we get a, a pull request mm -hmm. from somebody else yeah what does the git verb do it does a fetch and rebase so before i had aliases for git fetch and git rebase but then I got tired of running two commands, so I made an alias for two aliases. Um, let's see. So it should be pushed now. Um, should I put the URL? Can you just to try once more? Is the test passing locally? Uh, hmm. Can you try this on your computer? Why does hmm. it fail now? Division by zero. So we are dividing by n, which is zero. Um, can you change something here? I guess probably not. Huh? Oh, I know why. It's failing because, uh, wait, where did it go? Here we go. For i and, yeah. So it was testing this with you're starting with zero so now we start from okay there we uh, go two 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 nine, nine, nine or two two okay that's good uh, yeah and we get comment here on hackmd so what we are describing today is example based testing mm -hmm. i think there is much more there is behavior test testing behavior based Yeah, there's just so many different ways to test. One of my favorite things I did was fuzz testing. Actually, this wasn't fuzz testing. There was some problem with memory, not memory leaks, but anyway, something with C memory. So in order to fix it, I just had it run all of my tests in sequence a hundred times and I saw the error. And then I commented out individual test cases from there until I found which test could actually reproduce it because this was not reproducible. It depended on how the memory layout of the program worked. And that was quite like annoying to test. Yeah, these are but, really the most difficult ones, memory bugs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but there's just so many different ways to test that. Actually, it would be neat to have a lesson where we go and just yeah. describe all the different types of strategies. Yeah, and also it go. It was a suggestion at the last time or the, uh, the time before to to start. We have a segmentation fault, so to start with the memory problem, and then we try to debug it together. Try to locate uh, these things. Yeah. Okay. So. 
Yeah, so where is the code now? Um, it, it, it... Can you do like a git remote minus V? Yeah, it's in RSH demos. Oh. And do you have the git instead of setup with an RSH alias? I didn't do that yet. <laughs> not on this, not on the laptop that I'm mm -hmm. sharing from. Yeah. Should have. Yeah. Um yes, from okay, I see I see it on my screen, so I can also take it from here. Do you want me to paste it into the HackMD? The uh, the alias? Yeah. No, or, I can no, I, the... I, I, the URL. The, I can. I, I see it on my screen. The, the URL. Okay. Okay. Good. So. So maybe you can switch. I can take over screen oh. share and then. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is. You know. And the goal now. So this is the repository. Here, Richard pushed to it a couple of minutes ago, mm -hmm. and I want to now enable GitHub Actions. It's one of the. It's not the. It's one of the many ways to have automated testing. Yeah. So you can have GitLab continuous integration. There is Travis continuous integration. Mm -hmm. There is AppBear, Circle CI. Yeah. There is probably more. Uh, I will now show GitHub Actions because yeah. if the code is on GitHub, it's it's really very little to do yeah. to set it up. Was GitHub and Actions? Was it announced less than a year ago or more than a year ago? I seem to remember I about so. maybe in August or September or October last year. Yes, and then it was in beta until I think yeah. recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I really um, like it, but it annoys me a little bit how GitHub's taking over everything, but well. <laughs> Yeah, I like it too, and I somehow don't like myself for liking it so much. Exactly. That's exactly how I would describe it for me. <laughs> yeah. So let me add that. Oh, I will click here on the actions top. And there are many, many ways to get started, but I will use these starting, starting scaffolds. And then we will, in a second step, I will modify a little bit. And for like any language, there is a example mm -hmm. workflow that one can take, take as a starting point, yeah. but I will I will take the Python one. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, and what, what it does, it, it opens up mm -hmm. this new file but in a web interface. So I can give it a different name if I want. I can call it. Wow, test. I should use this. So far, I've always made the YAML myself, but this is oh. much nicer. What's the license of this file? Does it contaminate my repository and make it a derivative work mm. of this. <laughs> Good question. I never, I never thought about that. I wonder whether this is clarified somewhere. Mm. Uh, but what we see here is uh, it will be a file which will be added to a specific place. And then there are some directives. So on every git push, only on the master branch or towards the master branch. But of course, we can modify that. Mm -hmm. It should do a certain series of things. We will. It will do that on a Ubuntu container, on a Ubuntu image. But we will. I will show. If we have time, I will show how we can even test on Mac and on Windows. And yeah. you, I think you can test on your own images. Mm -hmm. Then it sets up Python environment. It installs. It even runs Flake testing, linting. This is something we show. Mm -hmm. If I don't like, I can move it. Yeah. I will keep it, but I will. I will simplify that a little bit, and this will be important later. Well, something mm. happens. I will do this. Okay. I will remove. No so if. Bit. Yeah. And down here, it is a bit more linting. If I if I don't like it, I could remove it. But that's the important one. Pytest. Mm -hmm. Should I? Uh, how did you run it locally? Only by pytest, or did you do pytest and then? Just pytest is enough. To... Um, All right, so let's yeah. try it. And now I can start commit. I guess it will ask me for a commit message. Let's see. Yes, uh, starting out with with test by test using GitHub Actions. 
I will commit that. Now I want to check whether this is doing anything, and then I will improve it a bit. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to make a push to the rep repository? Well, I guess you can see if it's... Yeah, yeah. it's running. So I clicked on okay. It started running here. Uh, and on the build, there are actually several steps that it does. These are the steps that are part of this workflow. It's installing dependencies. This will really take only a couple of seconds. And it, I expect it to pass. I think if we have time, maybe, yeah, I think we have time. I could, like, the thing I wanted to show is how can I add now Windows and Mac testing? And how can mm -hmm. I have maybe test on different Python versions instead of just Python 3.8? I want to maybe test also on, I don't know, yeah. 2.7 or 3.5. Should I show that or? Yeah. Or maybe, well, yeah, why not? Let's throw it in there. Yeah. Several different Python different versions thing. and several different. Operating systems. And in the meantime, this thing will test, and, in, and when I come back, it will be ready. What I, I will do that now in my terminal. Oh, I will clone. Okay, it says it's finished and the job completed. So, you want me to uh, show here? Well, your work. Yeah. Oh, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. And now, so I got this. I got. Uh, I got the repository, and there is this. What was it called? GitHub, GitHub workflows. Workflow. There is the file, and now what I do to improve it, I normally take look at some of the other repositories that I have where I already went through it. Polygons, yeah. because I already here, I said, so I will normally try to copy paste from one of my other repositories. You know, I got so a I bit will... tired once of finding all of the different, so, I have several repositories I copy from, but I can't remember which repository has the actual code I need. So I made a repository called templates where I would put my best practices mm. example of each, like the GitHub Actions example, the Travis example, the setup.py example, and so on. And then comment this really well and make sure it has everything I might ever need. We can talk about that later. So anyway, what we see here is the strategy includes a matrix. So the matrix does the Cartesian product of Python's 3.6, 3.7, 3.8 by Ubuntu latest, Mac OS latest, and Windows latest. So all possible combinations. And really it, all yep. it does is it sets a variable. And if you look down, we see under name um, with Python version. So it's just referring to what we see up there. So it's, the matrix isn't just limited to what you see, um, mm -hmm. like what they pre-program, but you could have versions of other packages. Like I was writing something that depended on Jupyter Hub, not writing, I was editing something that depended on Jupyter Hub. So they would test with the last few releases of it just to make sure it was compatible with all of them. So there's so much power mm -hmm. once you get to matrix testing. Yeah, so here we expect nine tests mm -hmm. to run. So let's see what it's actually working. Get diff. This is what I did. And now it's status git add test, git commit, and test on also on Mac OS and Windows, also multiple versions, Python versions. Git push origin master. Okay, and now back to the, we are here. Later, it would have been maybe nice to add a readme and we can add a badge, like a test badge, which will then take us to this page. Here, some testing mm -hmm. started. And here we see that it, it really runs through mm -hmm. these yeah. nine different test cases. And, and I expect them to pass. But, and if they don't pass, then I made some detailed mistake. But I yeah. think it's, that's not the point. I wanted to show that with relatively little steps, we got we got quite far, and we mm -hmm. have great pass testing here. And one could uh -huh. then the follow up step would be if I want to deploy this code to, for instance, PyPI, I would I could again add it to the workflow. I could have a workflow for deployment. So this is my I have a 
-hmm. I have a workload that packages it. And it does it only when I create the release. And mm -hmm. then it mm -hmm. then it does some stuff and uploads it to PyPI. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to do anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd like to set up this automatic PyPI releases. Did you get this from one of the GitHub scaffolds there? Oh, this I collected from <laughs> a few repositories from friends who <laughs> did that before me and for some blog posts. So that was, that was like two days of work to get everything out. Mm -hmm. It like was not really this file. There was a lot of other things that I need to figure out. So that was quite some work. And I I should write I should write up how I did that. And I think it would be nice to have a session on Conda PyPI and how to automate the deployment. Yeah. Yes. You know, right. we it have would, like three minutes left or something like that. It would be neat if you had done this test going down to Python 3.5 because I think it would fail mm -hmm. on 3.5 because this random dot choices isn't there. And in fact, I do this sometimes. Usually when I release something, then I'll keep decreasing the Python version and see how low it can go before it starts failing. And then I know what to announce as my oldest supported Python version. And then usually try to make it support something older if it's easy. So, yeah. So here it's, I sent it in. We will probably see it failing then in a moment. Yeah. There's a question on HackMD. Who pays, um, who pays for the GitHub Action CPU power? Is there a limit? So there are some limits. So GitHub itself is paying. Well, I guess really the people that are paying GitHub for private repositories for organizations. For public repositories, it says free. And private repositories, I've seen something that says 2,000 minutes per month. I'm not sure if public has any upper limit. I guess surely there must be some sort of limit there. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know precisely, but uh, many of these services are about like one hour runtime. So mm -hmm. if it's if it's like many hours, then it doesn't. It's good to have a set which runs in minutes, like less than one hour. Yeah, but I don't know precisely the limit here. Yeah, I think it's well, it's. It's also Microsoft paying. It's running on Azure, and and I think yeah. it's also a way to uh, to lure us mm -hmm. <laughs> onto the cloud uh, and yeah. to find it that way. And we, we can already see that the three five as you as you yeah. anticipated, uh, one of them is failing. Yeah, this and is you find out what happened. Uh, and the rest failed because once one failed, it canceled all the rest, basically saving the CPU time from running stuff that it assumes will probably fail. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's exactly the error I'd expect with Python 3.5 because mm -hmm. the documentation said it was new in 3.6. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, back to the this being free, that's one of the reasons why I don't like it. It's just a bit too much luring everyone in for free and it's going to end up replacing so many other good services and make a much more, um, what's it? hegemony mm -hmm. of um, of the services we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We have so, like five minutes left. Uh, we wanted to talk about Git history, right? I wonder whether we have enough time or should we yeah, well, it? Let's do it, I'd say. It's okay if yeah. we go a little bit over. It's a cool little mm -hmm. non testing related trick. Yeah. I think it's I think it's doable in ten minutes. Yeah, maybe less. Yeah. Okay. So the goal is we can continue here on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I I edit. Uh, so the goal is we have some. There is a there is an example repository here that I created earlier today. Mm -hmm. And I edit some code. Uh, this is this is the master branch. There is not much. There is a license file and a readme file. But in this example code, I want to show how we can, uh, how do we rewrite history in Git? For instance, if I want to squash commits, if I want to combine them, or I want to reorder them, or I want to delete some of them, we will see something I learned about recently, which is there is an option to to create fix up commits. So I will show that. 
I have this master branch, there is not much. Then I have a branch which is called feature. And on the feature branch, it's a very simple code. It's a Python code. There are two files right now. There is one called adding. Mm -hmm. And all it does, it, it adds two numbers. There is one function to add two, two numbers together. And then there is a file called, there is a module called multiply, and it does multiplying. Mm -hmm. So not much to it. Our goal will be to add the one function that does subtracting. There are, I did, so this was a master. I did two more commit, commits. One commit was, I, I did this multiplication. And in one commit, I added this adding functions. Mm -hmm. And now I want to simulate a bit how I work, because the way I work is it's not always very structured. There is some chaos to it. Sometimes I forget something, and I add it later. And that's OK. But then before maybe sharing my commits, I clean them up, and I will show you how I do that. And then yeah. there are many ways to do it. And we yeah. will hopefully, hopefully, I will do two two ways. Yeah. And for me, the worst it. for me the worst thing about this is that I use it too much. So I basically obsess too much about making clean commits when, in reality, it probably goes a little bit too far. And I should just, yeah. you know, work faster and let the rest yeah. deal with itself later. And it's maybe more important when you contribute changes to to some really prominent open source project mm. where they require it. Mm. And then there is the question like, what is the size of commit? What is too small? What is too big? Mm -hmm. And I try to, then I try to make commits of the like right size. Mm. And, and I think we can think all of us can think what what is the right size. For me, it's, it's a commit that is pickable, that is cherry pickable, mm -hmm. that somebody else might want to cherry pick to a different branch. So that's a, that's a really well sized commit for me. Yeah. Okay, let's go in. We have this code. I will switch to. I will switch to this feature branch. Get log one line. I, I have added this multiplication. Added the. I have added the. Uh, addition. And now I will do. What I will do now is. Let's simulate that we add a debug print to the multiplication, because sometimes I add some debug prints, and then later I maybe forget them, or I want to remove them. So debug arguments parameters are A and B. So there's a debug print here. Mm -hmm. Status, git diff, git add, multiply, git commit, and I will do it quickly now. And that is uh, a debug print. Later, I will want to clean it up, but now I have it in the code. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing I want to add is I will add a subtract routine. Subtracting. OK, but now I'm subtract, and I do a copy-paste mistake. Because I named it, but I forgot to. Uh, there will be a problem here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't see it now. I will later see it when I add the testing. I will not add the testing here, but uh, I would I would find it out later. Git commit function to subtract. Okay, now now I realize the problem, but I already made a commit. Git log one line. This was not. It's not complete. It was actually wrong. Um, I could now amend, but I will now do something different that I learned about last week, and which is already new since years. And that is, I can. Are you fixing the subtract function now? Yeah. Do you want to fix something else first, and then are you going to do fix up now? Yes, I want to show. Fix yeah. up. So let's fix something else so that it's yeah. yeah that is maybe more difficult. Yeah. Let me add something to the. To the adding, it's not really a, like a bug fix, but maybe I wanted to add a documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, documentation here. I wish I had done it when I actually created the add function, mm -hmm. but I realized later. Yeah. Git status. Oh. Git add, and now I can do. 
Okay, what was it? GitLog one line. So I wish I had done it back here. So now I can say git commit minus n. Oh, it's not like that. Git commit fix up. I can say this thing that I'm about to commit, it is a it is an addition to that commit. It was meant to be an addition to that commit in the past. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see how it looks now, git log one line. So I got this new commit. And the git, the git created this for me. It says fix up, and it was a fix for this one here. And now I want to add another fix up, and I want to fix this subtract function. Mm -hmm. Right? Let's fix, let's fix that one. So it's, it should be a minus. Git dip subtract, there is a minus. And the same same idea. Now I want to I want to fix this one here. Git commit fix up this hash two b two e and so on. Okay. And now I could go on. I could. What would be the next thing? I should maybe add some requirements to text. But now I don't want to make it too lengthy. So the next thing. So now I want to clean up these commits. Git log one line. I would like to get rid of. I would like to get rid of this one here, mm -hmm. and I would like to combine the adding with the adding and the, yeah. the subtract with the subtracting. Be amazed and at what you're I about think... to see. This is going to be cool. Sorry? Be amazed at what you're about to see for our audience. This is going to yeah. be cool. And I think I will first show it in the way that I learned recently, which is with the auto squash. And then I will show it in the more pedestrian way how I, would, how I was doing, because I think it can also be useful, uh, how I was doing before. Because sometimes you don't have these fix up commits. I mean, you have a history and they are not, people didn't mm. create these fix ups. So then what can you do then? So I will show you two ways. Anyway, we will now change history. Whenever I'm about to change history, the first thing I do is I create a backup branch. Just in case I mess up, I can always go back. Git branch backup. I will come back to it. Mm -hmm. So now I have this feature branch, but I also have the backup branch. Mm -hmm. There are also nice ways to come to recover, but I always do that when I do something a little bit less trivial. Yeah. And now, what was really good is that when I started working on it, I I immediately created a feature branch. I wasn't working on the master branch, but that is really convenient because now I can do a interactive rebase. So git rebase interactive based on master but now i will say auto squash and when you do based on master that means from your current branch everything after master is being rebased yeah. so yeah so master is not changing the stuff that's not in master yet is so yeah. let's this will only modify, modify my current branch yeah instead of master i could also i did give one of these hashes but this is what I do often. I work on feature mm -hmm. branches, and I can. I don't even have to think about it. I can do this. Yeah. And the auto squash is interesting because it will it will understand the fix ups. And if I now open it up, let's see what we see. Do 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 do. It will already understand that I probably meant to. It it has reordered the commits. Yeah. It Where? has moved the the adding fix up right behind adding. And it has moved the uh, the subtracting fix up right behind the subtracting. Yeah. There is also the debug print, and I see that there are lots of options here that I can do. Yeah. I will at the same time I will get rid of this one. I will drop it. D or drop. Doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. And if we look and below, there's this nice reference of what everything does. And actually, there's a lot more stuff there than I remember. Hmm. I have used yeah. until now. I have used squash and drop, and I will also show you in a follow up how you can reorder yourself. But it's really nice. So I know if I now leave it, if I save and quit, it it successfully rebased. It rewrote history, and if I now inspect the git log one line. It will look like I will look like I was a really organized person. So I started out by writing multiply function, then the adding, mm -hmm. and then the subtracting. Yeah. And if I let's let's inspect this one here, git show. 
you see that it looks like I added the correct support function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's great. And maybe I can show also how I was doing it until last week. And for this, I can go back to the my backup. This will be really quick. So I didn't know about the auto squash. What I was doing is this. And what I was doing here, I was you can move them yourself. So I was doing that. I was moving this to over here, and I was moving. This is fine. And then I can mm -hmm. say squash this into the previous one, squash mm -hmm. this into the previous one, delete that one. Yeah. Right, quit. Now it opens up the messages, so I can I can edit the messages mm -hmm. because it combines. Right. So right. I, decide I like the first one. Yeah. Actually, if you this use second one. fix up instead of squash in that rebase list, then it will automatically take the first message. So. Oh yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm. Okay. Okay. Same effect. And let's. Oh, good luck. Take a look. Online. Yeah. Yeah. Really nice. And I, I will add, there was a, this nice bot post that I love from, I will add it to the HackMD after the, after the podcast. Yeah, so... We are already going over time, but let's see whether we have any comments, questions. Yeah, let's see. There was comment on the Twitch chat. Good way to hide your mistakes and give the impression you write perfect code. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But then when I've gotten into some big projects, I have lots of debugging in code. Um, let's see, like lots of debugging code, which I usually label with temp or something at the start so I can easily find them all. And then the stuff I do, and I'm going and reordering stuff, and then it's getting to, like, after I reorder stuff, then there start being conflicts in things once I reorder some things mm -hmm. that can't be. And then... I have to solve those and I'm continually solving them and it's well useful mm -hmm. but well I'd say it's sort of fun but then I wonder is this what I want to spend my life doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah sometimes it gets a bit too much what I do instead is I do like one big soft reset mm -hmm. then everything is staged and I can look into it with the div tool mm -hmm. and I can remove all this ugly stuff and then, then I commit it one after another in chunks. So that's yeah. what I do sometimes if, it's, if this rebase becomes too much or conflicting. Yeah. That's actually a good idea, like just sort of giving up and then starting from scratch again. Maybe I should do that more often. Hmm. And a really good comment on, the, on Twitch. Yeah, Back to the Future has taught us to be very careful when uh, traveling in time and editing on history. And this is a really good point because Oh, I still I have to screen share because what I can let me check out to the feature. Let me try to do this thing here. Feature it will not work. And that's good that it doesn't work mm -hmm. because now I changed the history. Of course, there is I can force it. Yeah, uh, but uh, we should be always careful. Also, when when we do that on code that other people depend on. Mm -hmm. Because now we have changed yeah. how things were, and this is fine on my own computer when I haven't sh shared it. But yeah. once my colleagues starting depend on the code, I should be really careful doing these mm -hmm. history rewrites. Yeah, yeah. I must say, I actually do force push a lot. Either if the project is so small, I don't expect anyone else to be doing it. I'll force push. Say whenever I'm debugging the GitHub Actions YAML, usually it takes ten tries. So. I just force push 10 times in five minutes and eventually it works. And feature branches, well, I force push a lot. But if there are is a chance that other people would work on it, then I'll actually tell them in the issue or in the pull request and say, I'm probably gonna be force pushing this, so be careful. Yeah. Because, yes. yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, there is a question yeah. about git push force, git push force with lease. I don't know the letter. Oh, wow. Force with lease. No. I don't know. Never seen that before. I need to study. Yeah, and the comment just before, you have to rebase mm -hmm. fix up, ideally should work on a local branch, right? So either locally or it can be a, it can be a branch on GitHub, but then it should be clear to everybody that this is moving. That it's not... Um, mm -hmm. 
Have you used Force Boost Beast yeah. Beast before? Oh, sorry, say again. Have you used this force with lease before? No, I've I didn't, never seen it. I didn't before. even know about it, but oh, yeah, it I, looks. I if somebody knows, let us know, but we will find out until next time. We are running a bit over mm. time already. But okay. we really appreciate these questions and comments. Yeah. And, uh, and also, it would be really cool to get a project for binder writing. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a Python project. It can be a Python project, can be a Jupyter notebook. Okay. But it doesn't have to be. Yeah. There well, was more we wanted to say today, but we can then postpone it to next time. Yeah. Sounds good. So, um, well, we always have this weird point at the end where we give a conclusion and then we keep on discussing. So, should we even bother doing a, well, I guess we can just say we're done with the main show now. We'll hang around and answer these questions. Um, and well, thanks so much for listening and, watching and uh, suggesting and asking. Yeah. And also tell us, did you like today? So do you prefer things to be more scientific oriented or this kind of uh, tool and uh, get related and so on. So my impression of force with lease is that, so you push it once and you have the remote branch and your local branch or your local remote tracking branch. So basically you your local repository remembers what the other side should be. When you force with lease, I think it will check that the remote hasn't been changed from when you last pushed it. And if so, then it pushes and otherwise it will fail. Mm -hmm. Which I guess really makes sense because then... Um, so if someone else has been editing it, then it says, no, your time to force push is over and uh, like they get priority. So also what, what, I should, what we should have said, yeah. um, it's really good idea to protect like the master branch against force pushes. I think that you almost never want to do that. Mm. So there may be situations, but they require really yeah. communicating with the whole team Yeah, because um, yeah. Um, because when you when you see the error that I saw on my terminal, and it's a maybe it's, a, it's somebody who's new to Git and doesn't really know what these things really mean, the next thing I would do is I would take the error message and search for it in Stack Overflow, and then on Stack Overflow somebody will suggest that well you can solve it by force pushing, and then the person will try that git push for <laughs> master mm -hmm. and it works. And, there will be many yeah. sad faces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's, I think it's really good to protect the like against false yeah. pushes. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I would do that once there's multiple people working on the project. Like, if it's just me, well, yeah. or even it's sort of like a bet. So. I bet that no one else has pushed in the two minutes since no one has pushed or pulls in the two minutes that I've been working on something, so I risk it. And so far, it's been okay, but eh, I'm a yeah. I'm practical. But someday this is going to come back and bite me. I'm sure. <laughs> on, on my own repositories, I do it also on master. It's more about mm -hmm. if it's if you're a couple of people, I think it's good to protect. Yeah. Um, also looking at feedback, yeah, about more attention and viewers. Yeah, would be nice. So I'm also wondering how we can reach more yeah. viewers. It's maybe a link to that. I don't know why. Like, I don't have a gigantic Twitter following either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to advertise it, advertise it better yeah. somehow. But if, if, if you have ideas on how we can. Yeah. We need. We basically more. need your help to advertise. We're assuming that word of mouth will work, but well, mm, that only goes so far. 
Ja. Oh, my microphone was not good today. Sorry for mm. that. It sounded pretty loud here. Is it? Was it too quiet? Because maybe I needed to increase the volume on the side. He might be louder now. Uh huh. Yeah. Well. Okay. Hmm. Right. So. Thanks a lot. I think we have. Radovan was yeah, lagging. Mm -hmm. ah. Was I lagging? Say something, Radovan. Saying something? Hmm, maybe it is slightly laggy. Hmm. Well, I don't know. We'll Good. look maybe at it and see. Really bugged. Sorry about that. Yeah. We didn't notice. I didn't notice. Okay. Um. Well, I guess we will... Actually, yeah, someone come up with a good inspiration for next week so we don't have to. And with that, see you later then. Yep, see you next week. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye all.